When I think about aha moments in my research, uh, I'd have to say there were probably several. Uh, of course, there are always are. I mean, and as you continue to research, you know, you have those wonderful, lovely moments. But in terms of the work I did on, on Irish women on the Southern Avalon, uh, I think my first aha moment was in the archives. Uh, I had been warned that I wasn't going to find anything about these women. Uh, that there would be nothing there, that I was wasting my time. This was a PhD p project, so I was, I was panic-stricken. Uh, and about two weeks in, um, you know, I began to sort of see uh, through uh, the sort of very sort of male-centered nature of the sources. And this is something that I think lots of uh, social historians or, and women's historians will tell you, you know, that, that you need to read against the grain. So you look at court records, and your original response to seeing women there is, oh, these poor women. Oh, you know, they're victims of this, that. And then you start to think, wait now. These women were really there. Like, they're really all over in all sorts of capacities as complainants and defendants. They're mixing things up. They're there. There's something more going on here. So that's a very exciting moment, I think, really especially when you start at the point where all the archivists are saying, there's nothing here, to realize that there was a whole richness uh, of information there if only, you know, you could find a way to sort of tease out the interpretations. So that was one. Another aha moment, I think, for me was uh, doing oral history and realizing how much the oral history reinforced what I was drawing from the written sources and vice versa. And that uh, is very reassuring in some respects. Sometimes you, you expect to hear something completely different, and sometimes you do, do hear things that are quite different because they're not even covered in the written sources. But it still made sense, if that means anything sensible to you. You're getting different information, but it's not uncomfortable. It's not making you think, oh, I, I, this is completely different from what I over, understood over here. Uh, one absolutely wonderful story from the oral history. Do you have time for my little tale from oral history was about a Mrs. Clancy. Now, Mrs. Clancy was in, in Capelin Bay. She lived in Capelin Bay, which is now Calvert on the southern shore, and is very close to Fairyland. Uh, and the two communities are so close together, actually, that they share a graveyard. So that graveyard lies between the two communities. And if you actually go out the back of the graveyard, you're going to drop into a little cove called Lance Cove. Okay, so I had to give you a little bit of geography there so you'd understand the story. So this is a story I heard many times from the oral tradition. So you've got two families. You've got the Clancy's and the O'Toole's. Uh, a, a fellow by the name of Martin O'Toole, or Mert Toole, uh, as he was known, uh, came to the end of his labors on this earth, and uh, he was duly laid out and waked in proper fashion. Uh, but a dispute arose about the ownership of the grave that had been dug for him. According to the Clancy family, his grave had been dug in the Clancy family plot rather than the O'Toole family plot. Anyway, there was much heated debate and much back and forth, but poor old Mark Toole wasn't, uh, you know, holding up so well, so they figured they'd better get him in, so down into no man's land he went. Now, Mrs. Clancy was away at the time, uh, but she soon came back and she heard about it, and she wasn't one bit pleased about what she heard. Now, she's, she was just a little bit of a scrap of a woman, I'm told, uh, but she was a real boss. You didn't cross her. Uh, so anyway, She's not best pleased about all this. A couple of days later, Mr. Johnny Hines is walking over from Fairland to Capelin Bay. He's going to go out uh, with a, a friend in Capelin Bay to go fishing. And all of a sudden, this voice rises up from the graveyard. Johnny, to Johnny Hines, rather, she says. What, says Johnny. Give us a lift, she says. A lift at what, says he. Help me heave Mark Tool over Lance Cove. Well, this was Mrs. Clancy. She had the corpse dug up, had the coffin standing on its end in the grave, had managed to push it upright and was trying to heave it up and out over the cliff into Lanscove. 
Now, to me, I just, I just so enjoyed this story, even it, for its own sake. But it didn't, it didn't jar me. You know, a lot of people might say, well, that's only old foolishness. My God, they could see the academic coming up over the road with tape recorder. Yeah, they had that story out for you, all right. But in ter terms of, um, you know, a very strong woman uh, being very defensive about family property, and when nobody else is willing to do something about it, she did something about it. And her sense of her position in, in the sort of spiritual world of, of the, the community, it was all there. And wouldn't you know, about three months later, I'm in the archives, and I actually came across a letter from the Justice of the Peace in the place at the time. And he's writing the Attorney General of Newfoundland, and he's talking about this highly unusual case that has come before him. This woman has dug up a corpse, and she tried to get send it over the cliff. And, uh, you know, the, the, the brother of the deceased was outraged and who could bring charges? Was it the, the next of kin or was it the priest? And what kind of fine should be assessed? And perhaps a prison term was, was the right way to go. So it actually, really honest to God, did happen. Not that I doubted the oral tradition, but for people who were naysayers and say, oh, that's only old foolishness. There it was, all nice and tidy in the written source. So that was a fabulous aha moment.